Dr. Tan is a board certified gynecologist and minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon. She's an internationally recognized leader in reproductive health. And I know because I've seen so many of the amazing videos that she's done on social media. She has millions of viewers across the world each month on TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram. And they're all educational videos about period health, pelvic pain, gender affirming healthcare, and reproductive rights. So we're talking really, really important topics. And her goal is to break down the stigma around reproductive health and empower people to understand their own bodies and take control of their health. So here we go. Welcome, Dr. Karen Tang. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I honestly can't thank you enough. I genuinely feel like the things we're going to discuss today are going to be so helpful because I've got your book in front of me now. It's not hysteria because it's not, is it? Mm -hmm. I mean... What made you, first of all, if we start with our listeners so they know a bit more about you, who you are, how did you get into women's health? And in particular, of course, delving deeper into areas that actually haven't been as researched as we'd like them to be. Absolutely. So uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a gynecologist. I'm outside of Philadelphia in the US and my specialty is pelvic pain. So in my day job, I was seeing just countless, countless women coming in every single day with things like endometriosis, fibroids, PCOS, you know, where they had been trying for years oftentimes to get help, going to doctor after doctor, going to the emergency room um, and just really having their concerns dismissed or being told, oh, that's just normal and really struggling to get just basic care. And I know this is now a universal experience. It's not just in the US, it's not just in the UK, for whatever reason, and we can talk about all of this during the episode, um, you know, women's health concerns are generally dismissed, they're un- misunderstood, there's not enough research, and just this leads to people suffering unnecessarily. So I started doing social media a few years ago just to help raise awareness. And that really took off because there's such a, you know, people just resonated so much with this experience of, oh my gosh, that's happened to me. I, I, you know, tried so hard for so many years and was having severe pain. I was throwing up. I was having, you know, heavy bleeding. I was having fertility issues, menopause issues. All of these things are basically almost universal experiences. If you've ever had a period, uh, one of the things in the book has happened to you and you've had to, you know, struggle to try and get care for it. So it just became really important to me to to be an advocate and to try and fight for these things and to raise these discussions, you know, to, to make people feel comfortable having them. Because part of the problem is honestly, we find it, you know, it, culturally, oh, it's embarrassing. Oh, you don't talk about your periods. You don't talk about trying to get pregnant or you don't try, you know, talk about menopause. Um, and that leads to this culture of secrecy of um, also treating women's health like it's not real health. It's not as important as diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease. Um, whereas in reality, all those things are mixed into women's health too, as we'll discuss. Absolutely. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. Secrecy comes from us not being open about it. It Uh does become like this taboo subject and it really shouldn't be because every woman will experience some sort of um, symptom or they'll have a question around it because we all we all live through it. So why is it so hard to get a diagnosis for these things? I've read various statistics of how many years it can even take years for some women to discover that they perhaps have endometriosis, for example. Like, I just don't understand why we're so behind if you could just give us that bit of insight oh, yeah. it must be so frustrating that's a complicated answer but you know so when i was researching for the book for the uk edition i actually discovered that the average years to diagnose of endometriosis is longer in the uk than in the us in the us it's 7 years in the uk i believe it's 8 years mm-hmm. and you know part of that is like the healthcare system how hard it is to even get to a gynecologist in the uk um, but in general there are several things one is that you know, going back to the question of, you know, is this real healthcare? Um, When you look at the amount of research funding that goes to women's health, it's a tiny fraction of the amount of funding that goes to many other health conditions, even ones that affect so many fewer people. <laughs> so for instance, you know, there are um, a, like a, things like diabetes, which is obviously an important issue. It affects about the same percent of the population for women as endometriosis does. But diabetes gets like orders of magnitude more funding. So we know much more about it. We have more details. We have more treatment options. You know, for women's health, there are so few diagnostic and treatment options just in general. So diagnosis-wise, a lot of the things that affect women don't have 
a simple test. So in medicine, we love things like, you know, a, like a blood sugar reading, an EKG result. We're like, oh, look at that. That's abnormal. But for women's health, for endometriosis, there's not an easy test. So you have to actually have laparoscopic surgery to find and diagnose endometriosis. There's no like test for PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, you know, perimenopause, oftentimes all your tests are completely normal. So the problem is, is that doctors will say, oh, look, all your tests are normal. Your imaging's normal. Your blood work's normal. So you must be fine. <laughs> and then there's nothing going on with you. And then dot, dot, dot. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's in your head. You know, maybe you're over scrutinizing your body or you're hypochondriac. So, and uh, just historically, you know, the reason the book is called It's Not Hysteria is because, you know, women's health and the reproductive organs and their mental health have all been just really tied together. And so a lot of times, you know, you get that jump from we can't find anything to maybe it's psychological. Um, and then just in general, uh, like I said, it, it is sometimes so hard just uh, system wise to get into a specialist for the UK. I've heard it's something like like many months up to a year sometimes to get into a gynecologist. Is that right? Oh, it can be longer. I, I do believe it can be longer. I mean, since COVID as well, a waiting list, but that's a whole other, a whole other subject. But do you find as well, so those reasons obviously make perfect sense, but equally how frustrating. And on the flip side, do you find it's because a lot of women just put up with it? Like I find sometimes I'm questioning myself, is this normal? Is it not? I mean, how do you know when you should seek that type of support? Yeah, that's an excellent question because I think that is part of the problem. It is also just, you know, culturally, like people pass this down from, you know, like parent to child that, oh, that's just normal. You know, everyone has bad periods. Everyone has menopause. I actually, I'm in a discussion group with women physicians and I kid you not, there was a woman who was like, I'm dying of menopause symptoms. I like can't function. I can't sleep, you know, but I just can't put up with this anymore. And people are like, you know, there are treatments, right? You're a doctor. And, you know, just even within like, you know, like us as human beings, as doctors, like forget that, yeah, you don't have to suffer with this. It's, you know, people have this conversation they're like, oh, well, it's just natural. Like everyone's bodies have periods, everyone's bodies have go through menopause. Um, and so the implication is, well, people have put up with this for all of these generations. So yeah, you should yeah, just keep yeah. putting up with it. And that's absolutely not true. You shouldn't have to put up with it. Um, I One of the things I say the most is even if something is common, it's not normal. If it's affecting your ability to live your life, to do the activities you want to do, um, that does not mean that you have to keep on suffering with it. So, um, you know, just like I, I, my husband, I use this example too. My husband just like, you know, injured his leg. He had like a pinched nerve and he was, you know, let me go to the doctor. Let me get physical therapy. I can tell everyone about it. I'm not embarrassed. Um, but, you know, God forbid someone's like, oh my God, I'm like having the worst period bleeding. I just can't, I'm bleeding so much. But people feel embarrassed, like telling their partner, their boss, their friends. Um, there's just this, this culture of, well, you know, I'm just going to kind of keep it to myself until I can't tolerate it anymore because I just if you would feel too embarrassed sharing about this. Um, so culturally, that's part of the problem. And then, you know, there's just this mystery of what is normal. Um, you know, part of the reason I write the book and I do the social media is just, you know, people deserve that information. You should know how to tell, like, this is a normal period. This is normal um, versus what is a level of something that you should get care for. And I tell people the the big rule of thumb is if it's affecting your quality of life, if you aren't able to do what you want to do in your life or meet your own health goals, like that's when you should yeah. be seeing your doctor or even before, before it gets to that point. Yeah, no, that, that's really, really helpful. And I think it's really helpful to have social media accounts like yours. And even I mentioned recently, you know, since having my children, my cycles changed completely. Everything just seemed to become worse, if I'm being honest. I'm sure it's not like that for every woman. But for me, particularly, I've noticed ovulation pain I never used to get. I notice I have to wear double protection if I'm on stage giving a talk. And I've, I've got to do it. So I just have to level up, but I'm still able to do those things. So for any women out there that are not physically able to do what you need to do with the resources around you, seek help. That's the message mm -hmm. here. Exactly. And I'll actually point a little fun fact, you know, that exact scenario you mentioned of I was doing fine. I had my children and then my periods just went completely out of whack. Um, very often that's something like adenomyosis or sometimes fibroids, like um, adenomyosis, which is like endometriosis, except it affects the walls of your uterus. A, the classic story is I was doing okay. And then I had kids, especially if you had a C-section. And then 
after that, periods super heavy, really painful when they weren't before. And so, um, you know, that's something that because a lot of women have that story and they're like, you know, it's been like 10 years and I just yeah, kind of was just dealing with it because yeah, I thought that it. just happened to everyone. It doesn't happen yeah. to everyone. Yeah. No, thank yeah. you for sharing that. And actually, I've got a friend that's been diagnosed with adenosis recently and she just had two kids. It's really, yeah, it's all alarm bells are going, well, not alarm bells, but red flags are going in my head. So, it's really important to keep an eye out on that and understand your cycle, isn't it? Do you recommend that women should track their cycle then so they understand and have that data? So if we're lucky enough to get to see someone like yourself, we can say, look, here's my data. This is how regular I am. And this is... Yeah, it does help. And and I do tell people, um, you know, sometimes people get very overwhelmed with like having to do things, quote unquote. I tell people, if it serves you well, do it. If it gives you information that you can use, you can take to your doctor and it can make your appointment more effective, then yeah, definitely do it. Um, you know, don't do it to the point of like it affecting your mental health negatively like some people are like oh my god like i i forgot to log it you know they they, they kind of beat themselves up um you know but just whatever information you can get it is helpful just to notice patterns so um you know like you just logging it if you notice oh gosh you know my cycles are super irregular like one time it's two weeks one time it's two months um you know it lasted for like 12 14 days like that is definitely important information to know um and i tell people to log also pain symptoms or bladder symptoms so we actually tell people to keep log of both of those things. So if you have pain, noticing what you ate that day, what you, you know, what activity you did that day, where you are in your cycle is super illuminating because it really like, you know, tells you sometimes like the cause of the pain. Sometimes it seems so mysterious. You're like, oh my God, I had this random pain. But then you realize it was like, it was always around when ovulation happened or always, yeah. you know, when you ate a certain food. Um, and same thing with bladder symptoms. Like a lot of people have, you know, like like bladder urgency or incontinence. Um, just logging, you know, when does it happen? How often? You know, when you ate, you know, drank certain things that can, you know, um, uh, trigger your bladder. You know, it's all very helpful. So information is power. I think, especially again with very short appointment time. Sometimes you wait super long for an appointment. You only have like fifteen minutes. You want to hit the ground running. So just kind of presenting your doctor, like, look, here are the patterns. I've noticed these irregularities, blam, it, it just kind of saves so much of that precious appointment time. Absolutely. Get your toolbox ready and then present the tools to whoever you're seeing. I love that. I think that's going to be so helpful for people listening. And then if you look at the fact that we've got some statistics here as well, actually, before I go on to the stats, just to ask you as well, very quickly about this, but PMDD is becoming more commonly spoken about. And I know you mentioned it earlier. Do you want to just quickly explain to people what PMDD is before I move Yeah, of course. I actually have a book on PMDD in front of me right now. It's <laughs> another woman in my US publisher, a published a book called The Cycle. It's about premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So premenstrual dysphoric disorder, a lot of people may not have even heard of. But when you hear the description, a lot of people go, yes, that's exactly what I have. So it, premenstrual, symptom, pre premenstrual syndrome is where, you know, very common, you have mood symptoms with your periods, you have some physical symptoms like bloating or um, uh, breast tenderness, cramps. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is the extreme version of that where it's very significantly affecting your quality of life, especially the mental health aspect. So if you're having such severe depression, anxiety, um, anything that affects your ability to function, that is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Just by definition, if you have, you know, with the period before your cycle, be I'm sorry to clarify, uh, in the two weeks before your actual menstrual period starts, that's the classic sign that during those two weeks, predictably, you have very, very, very severe, you know, mental health um, changes, um, and also oftentimes physical changes, you know, with the bloating with like the um, uh, breast pain and things like that. So um, a lot of people think that that's just normal PMS. It's not. So again, that's the difference. If you're just like, I get a little moody, I get a little bit blue, but I'm fine. Uh, when you get to the point that you're like, I can barely focus on work. I feel like I'm going to harm myself. Like I, I have severe relationship issues. I conflicts with my partner during that time. That's premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Such a lot. And it's so interesting. You say, please take a note of everything, even down to what we see in the, the clinic with the psychologists and our nutritionists as well. And often, actually, the dietitians, even with eating disorders, we've noticed there are huge links, of course, of your gynecology linking back to the diet you consume, your body weight, your shape, your size, your predispositions, because everything makes you you. And there are some things we can do, can't we, to help along the way. And there's definitely things with food. But I'll touch on the food in a bit, because according to cancer research, and I wanted to discuss this, because I think we have an opportunity to raise awareness here, and we can use this platform to really do some good. 
Um, 99.8% of cervical cancers are preventable. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is just, it blows my mind. Can we touch on the screening on the vaccine, the HPV vaccine? Because there's things out there we can do. 99.8%. Absolutely. Yeah. Cervical cancer is actually one of the big success stories in public health. Right. So, you know, so much of women's health is just, you know, it's bad news. We're just like, we don't know. It's terrible. Yeah. Cervical cancer and breast cancer are actually two of the big success stories. And the reasons are that, um, you know, with cervical cancer, there is a known cause, which is HPV, human papillomavirus, which is sexually transmitted. It's extremely common. So kind of point number one is to debunk this idea of like, oh, it's only if you are promiscuous. No, it's anybody who has ever been sexually active. The vast majority of people will actually have HPV at some point. So it's just almost ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, And the good news is because we know that cause, we can detect it you know, in earlier kind of stages, and we can try and prevent that infection with the um, the vaccine. So the vaccine in both the UK and the US recommended, you know, for both boys and girls um, in adolescence before they're sexually active. Um, and the points are, you know, with boys, one, obviously, the less HPV there is in the, you know, community, the less risk that, you know, a woman will acquire it and get cervical cancer. But also it causes other cancers too, like oral cancer is actually, it's becoming one of the more common, if not the more common now that, you know, smoking is a little bit on the downswing, um, causes of oral cancer. And then also anal, penile cancer, vulvar cancers, it causes other cancers too. So from a public health perspective, just decreasing the HPV in the whole world is is beneficial to everyone. Um, And then also, um, it, the uh, screening process, because cervical cancer is very slow growing in most cases, you can pick it up at precancerous stages and treat it to prevent it from turning into cancer. So in theory, we should be able to prevent virtually 100% of cervical cancers. There's very, very, very rare types that aren't HPV related, but the vast majority, like you said, over 99% are. Um, and so in certain countries, like I think in Scotland, they announced recently, like since having the HPV vaccine, I think they had among vaccinated people like 0% cervical cancer. And so you should be able to almost eliminate it with a combination of the vaccination and also the screening process, getting like the pap smear screening um, and, uh, you know, just being aware, you know, safe sex, using condoms, uh, things like that. So it's it's really exciting. It really, for those of us who work in in medicine and public health, we're like, yes, it's so simple, you know, get your screening, get your vaccine. You know, imagine if we could do that for breast cancer or for colon cancer, like people would be lined up out the door, (laughs) you know, like, of course we want to prevent cancer, it just makes sense. It's so much less suffering. Um, But because of the association with with sex, like it did have this sort of, again, like this, this tab, oh my God, it's, you know, my my children aren't going to be promiscuous. So I I, I don't need to get the vaccine, but it's for everyone. I got my kids vaccinated as soon as they reached the age that they qualified in the US. And so, you know, it's just, it just makes sense. What is the age? Uh, For US, it's 12. I'm not sure, um, you know, how old it is in the UK. It might be younger actually, but I'm going to look into that, make sure Yeah. I get my boys vaccinated. It's a, it's so interesting. I think anything where we're discussing vaccinations, people have to remember the positive impact that they can have. It's just groundbreaking and it's it's incredible. And for anybody who's concerned about safety, because that's, a, you know, you say yes. the word vaccine, people get the question of safety. So like hundreds of millions of doses of the HPV vaccine have been given over decades and decades, I think, you know, at least 20 years. Um, and there's been never shown like any significant adverse effect. Like um, it's only mostly just, you know, like any shot where you have like irritation or you might feel a little bit faint temporarily, but no long term effects. And like, so it's very well studied. So oh, that's compare that good. with cancer, <laughs> you know, like yeah, you're yeah, right. cancer risk, but yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And something we should discuss, because obviously we're a food food for thought. Let's discuss diet. Mm-hmm. Can we go back a little bit to diet, periods, menstruation, yes. even PMDD? Because I've been researching for my new book, which is out soon, The Benefits oh, of Plant-Based exciting. Diets. It is mm-hmm. exciting. Yeah, it's, it's crazy I love it. exciting. Yeah. Although when this comes out, it's probably going to be out. But mm-hmm. it's so interesting to see the research that the more fiber can have on us and plant-based diets. What do you have at your fingertips to share about diet and gynecology, I suppose. Yeah, there's quite a lot. And of course, I always give the caveat, I wish I had more data uh, because there's so many things that are like super promising and we're super excited. We're like, okay, yeah, that looks like it's going to be a really major thing. And then we're just like, we just, you know, the studies are very small. <laughs> so, uh, But just in general, so we were talking about, you know, PMS and PMDD, like there are some, you know, 
just very kind of easy dietary changes, avoidances, you know, like your salt, um, you know, fat foods, um, if, uh, like, like excess fat, um, and caffeine can affect things like um, some of the physical symptoms of PMS and PMDD, like the bloating, like the bowel symptoms, um, and sleep, like sleep is so key for so many things. Uh, I, I wrote my book about, you know, sleep and PCOS and perimenopause, it increases your cortisol if you're not getting enough sleep, and then that, you know, causes things like holding on to weight. So a lot of these are very uh, tied to, you know, what you eat, what you know, you know like exercise. Um, yeah, like you mentioned fiber and protein, um, also very important as we're learning about perimenopause, menopause. Um, and, you know, for everyone in general, <laughs> we all should use your, more fiber and more protein, but um, especially important uh, as you, you know, go through some of the hormonal changes of perimenopause and menopause. And then for that same phase of life, obviously, you know, calcium, vitamin D, uh, because of the risk of like bone thinning, bone loss. Um, something that is also uh, probably tied to a lot of things is vitamin D deficiency too. So, you know, you probably covered that a lot in your book. Yeah. Um, So associations with um, endometriosis, uh, fibroids, we don't know exactly how, and it's not like taking excess vitamin D will prevent those things. But, um, you know, if you have someone who's vitamin D deficient and you actually supplement them to a normal level, um, you know, the risks do seem to decrease a little bit. So there's like, yeah, some of those things are so easy. It's just, uh, you know, like you make like a small change and might make a big difference. I 100% agree. And why not if you can? And, you know, we should all, especially here in the UK, Northern Hemisphere, I mean, we don't get enough light and vitamin D. Not at all. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah, we, yeah, basically none. <laughs> <laughs> I love your answer. Not at all. Oh, God. No, not at all. Yeah. We get nothing here. So, you know, <laughs> we need all the help we can get, to be honest, Karen. <laughs> um, but yeah, diet, diet, people. Now, the pill, I want to touch on the pill with you because. Oh my goodness. When uh, I Social media up, is going crazy. Yes. Well, yeah. And I didn't even have social media growing up, but now I can only imagine like if I was bombarded with myths and misconceptions around it. And now I don't even know where to begin. I mean, I was having a look at how to, people have fears about it, you know, taking the hormones at a young age, can it impact their fertility? Should they be starting as teens? What are your thoughts? Contraceptive pill. Oh God, there's so much to say. So yeah. I always tell people, um, First of all, before you even kind of, you know, go into like the data, when you look at the risks of something, this is for anything, not just birth control, not just hormones, uh, you always have to compare it to the risks of the alternatives. And this is where the social media, like they love to be like, oh my God, this is dangerous. You get like the crazy guy, especially he's always a guy, like it's always some man. Um, and he's like, this is like so dangerous and bad for you, et cetera, et cetera. And then, but you don't compare it to the risks of the other things. So I use the the example, and this is extreme, obviously, but just it illustrates the point. If you, you know, have a gunshot wound and you're going for surgery, we have to tell people the risks of anesthesia. We have to be like, yes, there's some risk to being intubated and having anesthesia. But the risk of dying of your gunshot wound is way higher than any risk of anesthesia. That's why it's a, it's a no brainer. You're like, like, obviously, I'll take the anesthesia. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, so anything else you have to think about that way. Uh, for birth control, if you're using it as actually contraception, you have to compare it to the risk of pregnancy. So the risk of blood clots of mood disorder, you know, like mood symptoms of waking a million times higher in pregnancy than it is with the, the, the birth control, you know, no matter which birth control, birth control, like any medicine does have risks. So you know, the estrogen containing ones, there's a small clot risk, Risk, which, you know, we have to screen for things like, do you have high blood pressure? Do you smoke? Um, you know, those are, we have to make sure that it, you're somebody who has a good fit for each type of birth control. And I always say there's not one thing that's right for everyone. So, you know, neither should it be that everyone should be on birth control. You know, it's obviously, it's about fit. It's about finding the fit for each individual yeah, person. Um, you know, but anytime you hear like on anything, social media, a friend, whatever, and they're like, that is always bad for every single person or every single person should do this. You know, my cleanse my take my my pills my you know my course etc um you know scrutinize that because it almost nothing in healthcare is like 100% bad or 100% good um so back to kind of your initial question you had mentioned about like, you know, t- starting it young, are there risks to starting it when you're, you know, like 13, uh, you're having, you know, cramps that are really bad. Uh, the long-term data has not shown any significant impact uh, once you've gone through, you know, like puberty, like if you've actually started having your period, um, you know, you've already gone through pubertal changes, um, you know, it like it shouldn't have long-term impacts. The There's a myth about it affecting fertility. And the reason that myth exists is because of just time. 
So fertility for women um, decreases as you get older, and that's just based on your egg pool. So you have the eggs you start with, and you only have that number. It's not like men where you generate new eggs, like they generate sperm. So over time, the number of eggs goes down, the quality of the eggs degrades. And so that's why it's harder to get pregnant and you have more miscarriages and things as you get older. So um, you know, somebody who starts pills at age 18 and keeps going until they're 43, it's obviously just much, much, much harder to get pregnant when you're 43 than when you're 18. It's not that the pills did anything. It's just that time passed. So this is where you get the myths like, oh, so-and-so was on pills for 10 years and then she couldn't get pregnant afterwards. Um, you know, like she had no problem getting pregnant when she was 20, but then, you know, when she was 30, it was much harder and must have been the pills. Um, it's just because of time. So the pills like wear off in a day. That's why if you forget one pill, you can get pregnant immediately because, you know, it's out of your system so quickly. It doesn't have a long-term effect on your fertility. Um, and none of the other birth control, you know, like IUDs, none of it does. And so, um, so, you know, that's kind of a big myth. And then, you know, they, they can cause things like mood symptoms. Like I said, uh, the estrogen can cause the blood clot. So, you know, we do ha talk about fit. So sometimes people will, will try one thing and they do get symptoms. And so we try something else. So um, it's not that there's, you know, we were not also saying like, give it to everyone willy nilly, but, uh, but just to have the facts, like that's so important, yeah. just facts and like, in a like neutral way, not being like super sensationalistic. Um, I also tell people look at the the conflict of interests. A lot of times, those social media accounts that are like fear mongering, when you look at them, they're selling something. Like they're like, I'm selling my course about hormone detoxes, and you know, it, there's no evidence about that. Or they sell something that's not FDA approved. In the U.S., the FDA is you know regulates like medications, but you know like like supplements or whatever cleanse powders and stuff like that. They're not regulated. There's no safety at all data on them. So this is where people are like, oh, God, I well, I'm scared of the birth control. I'm going to take yeah. this completely unregulated, yeah. no oh, safety no. tested anything Unreal. product. No. So you have to watch that. Yeah, yeah they sell careful. them everywhere, Karen. They're absolutely oh, everywhere for everything. But, you know, positive, the, the pill can be really positive. For some of our eating disorder clients, you know, they're deliberately prescribed the pill for bone, bone density, like you said, reasons, I believe. Yeah, and like hormone I, supplementation. Yeah, exactly. And it's so it can be really helpful for people. So really weigh up your individual situation to anyone listening. But what about the man pill? Can we just can we just touch on the fact that it's on the onus seems to still be on women. And as a, as a mother to two boys, I find it very interesting how I'm going to approach this subject in many, many years. But um, yeah, it does scare me a little bit that we still don't seem to have progressed on the male side of the situation. No. no. <laughs> and again, when you look at what products are out there, what you know companies feel is worth research funding, um, I mean, one, they don't put much research into any birth control. But yeah, there's like, why would they need to create a birth control for men? Like, there's no market for that. Um, oh, you know, like, sarcastically. Uh, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> but um, so many of these things, yeah, it's, it's all driven by what the businesses think there's going to be a market for. And they're like, oh, well, men aren't going to want to take birth control. Why would they subject themselves to that? Why would they, the cost and the risk and the, you know, side effects and et cetera, when there's female birth control. Uh, so again, it, it's all very, you know, there's a the, the little layer of misogyny in, in all of these things. And so, you know, um, but I knew, uh, like, like you said, there's a lot of like other things too, that the, the birth control is used for other medical reasons. I just gave an interview for this because in the US, <laughs> birth control access is under threat as well. But, um, you know, people, people use it for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. It can like be life saving. I've had patients who literally were like feeling like thoughts of self-harm and they're like, this completely changed my life. Like I, I back to myself again. Um, uh, you know, people who have like painful or heavy periods, it can be very effective. Um, so it is something that uh, people, even if they don't need contraception are using it and it's important as an, as an option. Uh, but, you know, I do kind of point out because people say this all the time in the comments, they're like, well, why is it that there's only one category of medicine to treat all of these things? And that's also very problematic. Uh, it again, really if, you is, had, isn't it? if you had for men, one class of medicines that they used to treat like every Every problem that men go through, people would be like, that sounds ridiculous. But yeah, we do that for yeah. men. Well, there we go. Yeah. It's just another thing to plant the seed, the food of thought <laughs> that we've got right there. Um, what area of women's health then, Karen, do you think could do with, you know, a bit of a more invested eye? You know, what could in what could do of an injection of money and research? What do we need? Oh God, so much, like everything, everything. everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, it's tough because uh, this is where, you know, you have to think like, oh, what is most 
important or what is most valuable. And that's so hard to gauge when it comes to quality of life things. But, you know, being an endometriosis specialist and a fibroid specialist, I have to kind of pull a plug for those because they affect so many people and they cause such devastating like effects, you know, severe pain, infertility. Um, it affects like every, you were talking about like every aspect of your life, but it truly does. And, um, you know, so those things, even though they affect like, you know, endometriosis at minimum affects 10% of women, it probably affects a lot more. It's just we're underdiagnosing because not everybody gets surgery who has symptoms. Um, and then fibroids affect up to 80% of black women, 70% of white women. Um, you know, not all of them will have bad symptoms, but a lot of them will have, you know, be like hemorrhaging in the emergency room, like level of yeah. severe symptoms. So um, I do feel like those have been very, very, very under research relative to just the devastation they can cause. I think like I've seen statistics about just like just billions and billions of dollars of like missed work, um, you know, the healthcare costs, you know, when you look at it just from a purely objective, like, should we put more money in this? Yes. You know, you have to kind of always point to dollar bills and, you know, pounds. Um, so, you know, when you look at the impact on the whole society, it's really devastating. And so, um, you know, I would obviously put a plug for those uh, things like PCOS, which again, at least 10% of women, it's the most common endocrine condition in reproductive age women. But people are still like, we don't know what causes it. Like, no one knows. Uh, so, you know, for something again that affects so many people, affects their whole life, like, you know, we have yeah. so little research. So. Wow. I, I yeah. just find it so fascinating that, yeah, it's impacting so many people, yet still it's not making mainstream headlines in the same yeah. way. This is why be. I put a plug, whoever's listening out there, if you are yeah. involved in funding, in research and development, in industry, anything, you know, that please, please take on these, these topics yeah. are so important. Yeah, it, honestly, yeah. and I, I can think back through my life course so far of how many people I've met that have probably had endometriosis now I look back or, and now there are, I do see a few people saying, oh, you know, I've had a fibroid, I've had, it's, it's, it's everywhere, everyone knows somebody yeah. that has oh, been yeah. impacted Again, by when you, it. When you open these conversations. yeah suddenly you realize, oh my gosh, all these people have it. It's just, they didn't feel comfortable sharing that. Um, this happens even to me, like friends, when I tell them about the, my book or explain a video I just made, they're like, you know, I have all of those symptoms. I think maybe I have endometriosis. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You do. You probably do. You probably do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. One of the most, one of the videos that uh, has been the most like viral the, you know, videos I've made was about butt pain with periods that, you know, it showed a woman who was like, ow, like, you know, she's grabbing her butt and she's like, ah, stabbing butt pain. Why is that? And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's like one of the more common symptoms of endometriosis is like stabbing rectal pain with periods. It's not normal. That's not a normal thing. People are like, oh my God, I, I thought that was normal. Um, it's not. If you have any sort of severe pain with your period, it's not normal. Um, and, and that kind of blows people's minds a little bit like, oh my God, I've just been dealing with that for 10 years. I thought that was, everybody got that. And no, not everybody gets that. Yeah. Or same thing with diarrhea, like severe diarrhea with periods, not normal. Little loose stool, yes. Like a little yeah. bit of looseness. Yeah, okay. But yeah, lots of diarrhea, no. It's just, do you think as women, as a race, we are just uh, more stoic? Do you think we are just bred and in society, we are just groomed to make do, to just put up with it? Because we all just power through. What is it? Why are we biologically wired in such a different way to advocate for ourselves sometimes. Yeah, I know. Well, there's this joke about like the man cold. It's like if men get like a cold, they're just so overcome with like, you know, like yeah. they just can't function. Or people say, yeah. oh, if men had to give birth, like they would never be able to deal with it. Um, I think it is, you know, it's cultural. It's not like a physical thing. Like women are just better at it. It's just, I think just we've been so culture, like, you know, like a, a counseled or like told, like you just have to deal with this. Like, shh, just don't talk about it. Just deal with it. You know, like use a like a heating bottle, like whatever, uh, just kind of power through. And and this is where I want to say, like, oh my God, you don't need to. Like, th this is not something that you have to. You don't win a prize. Like you like like to feel like you have to suffer just because that's what women have done before is is not right. And so you know, again, with the story of the woman doctor was like, I just can't deal with this anymore. What do I do? I'm like, you use medicine, <laughs> like you, you get treatment for it. Like any other, you know, if somebody who would like broke their leg, they wouldn't, you yeah, went to you you get just treatment. People have broken their legs for thousands of years and they just yeah, tolerated yeah, yeah. it. No, no, it's just not, it's not fair. Yeah. And can we talk about very quickly? Cause I know with time, but with HRT, it's such a huge discussion, hormone replacement therapy, and there is so much circulating about that right now. It's really having a moment, but equally sadly, because there's not enough of it available. I don't know what the situation is over there, but here there's not enough. Um, 
go for it. What is your overview yeah. of HRT? So this is where I tell you, actually, UK has it a lot better than the US. Do we? Uh, so okay. my friend, yeah, Dr. <laughs> Nagat Arif, who was my my UK NHS uh, expert when I was you know revising my book for the UK edition, you guys have a lot more access to HRT than we do. Uh, in the US, it's horrible. It's like, it's so expensive. Uh, vaginal um, estrogen, which over in the UK is over the counter, which I did not know before the last couple of months. It's You could just go to the pharmacy and get it. Uh, for the US, it's like you have to like, uh, you know, try different coupon programs or like, you know, get authorizations from your insurance and it's such a hassle. But just back to the safety question, because, you know, there's been so much misinformation for so many years. Um, uh, a lot based on this big study called the Women's Health Initiative came out in 2002. That was actually when I was in my my medical school, you know, OBGYN rotation, so I'll never forget it. it. Before that, people were getting HRT very commonly. Like it was almost given just like, you know, keep your skin healthy and, you know, be youthful forever, uh, almost like too blasé. But the Women's Health Initiative um, showed that there was some increased risk of things like cardiovascular disease and breast cancer with estrogen and progesterone uh, HRT. And after that, everyone got super scared. They're like, no one should get it unless you're dying. Like, you know, like try everything in your power not to be on it. And if you really, really, really are desperate, then maybe. Um, and for like 20 years, that was like the mindset. Um, in recent years, they reanalyzed the, uh, the WHI study data and they saw that actually for younger women in the 40s and 50s, that that risk was like essentially nothing. Um, and that in certain cases, you know, breast cancer for estrogen alone, HRT, for someone who's had a hysterectomy, they don't need the progesterone part. Um, if you're just estrogen alone, it actually might decrease your breast cancer risk. So, uh, you know, when they kind of looked more closely at some of this data and really like kind of drilled down, they actually saw that the risks were very overblown. Um, and most people who have the hot flashes, like the sweats, the, um, you know, like the sleep issues, like all of those kind of symptoms are worse when you're first going through perimenopause and you're younger in your 40s, 50s, they tend to get better over time. So those risks of the heart disease, of the breast cancer, they go up with age two. And that's why, you know, back then people were taking HRT to much older ages, you know, you were taking it like into your 80s, 90s. So the reason that the risk looked really high is because you're grouping in all these women who are just having higher risk just because of their age. It's just like the birth control thing. Um, um, and uh, they were not actually seeing that the risk is much lower for someone who's younger who has a lower risk of those things just at baseline. So, you know, we obviously have to like look at a person's individual risks. Again, if they have a strong family history of like heart disease and diabetes and breast cancer, we might treat them a little bit differently. Um, but it's also different for different types of HRT. Again, this was the, luon the, the nuance was lost with that initial WHI I think They only looked at one type of HRT. It wasn't every type. So patches, for instance, don't seem to have a significant risk of blood clots. Um, and vaginal estrogen has no risk of almost anything because so little of it goes into your body. So again, when you look at the types, the risks are very, very different. So you know, this is where now we have to have a lot more nuance. We look at the different types of HRT. We look at the individual person's risk. Um, and you know, most people, unless you have specific risk factors in your history can safely take it if you need it, and especially the vaginal estrogen, even breast cancer patients, a lot of breast cancer patients um, with just a few exceptions can take vaginal estrogen without increasing their recurrence risk, which was not something that we knew about a couple of years ago. No, I was just going to say, I can't get over the noise that came out around it then all based off some- mm. One study. One yeah. study lacking nuance. Was it media headlines, sensational yes. things that yeah. came out? Yeah. Yeah. And and I've talked to somebody else, Dr. Jen Gunter, who's also like a gynecologist who, you know, writes books. She's very, you know, very well known. Um, she was saying that when you look at women's health, they 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 do tend to run with the sensational headlines. Um, she was saying that I think there's some sort of risk of like Viagra for uh for erectile dysfunction. And it has like similar risk numbers, but nobody knows about those risks. <laughs> like there's not like headlines like Viagra dangerous for you. No, of course not. No. Um so she pointed that out. She said, I always use that when I give talks and talk about, you know, how this, this risk got so overblown or, you know, like when you look at the risk of breast cancer increase, you know, with, with uh, certain things, it's like a few and many, many, many thousands of people. She's like, it's the same risk rate for Viagra and some, I, I forget what the exact risk was, but she's like, it's the exact same percentage who have this risk, but nobody hears about the Viagra risk and everybody hears about the women's health risks. So again, there's something like culturally where people love to kind of scare women, I guess, and, and just run with those news headlines. Um, so it is interesting why that is, but 
the amount. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Because I think for a lot of women out there, you know, HRT could be such a useful, helpful asset, really life changing for them. And we've got lots of questions from our listeners here as well. But I guess a lot of it as well, just for time wise, but it will be in your new book. It's not hysteria. Oh, yes. And yeah. I think it's so useful to have books like this because we need to get the answers. And if we're nervous about going to a doctor, at least we can have a read of your book and actually get to grips with it and understand that background behind yeah. those sorts of things like the one the study. The book, I wanted to be a resource for someone no matter what your age. Like, you know, if you're a teenager and you're just like, I was learning about everything. Or if you are, you know, going through fertility issues, or if you're going through perimenopause, menopause, if you're having sexual health problems, like literally everything in gynecology, um, except for like, say, childbirth, like, there's only so much you can cover in one book. But, um, you know, everything else in gynecology, not obstetrics, like you should be able to find the answer in the book. And that was the, the point was like, you know, I wonder this, you know, like, like leaking when I cough, like, boom, there's a chapter, like, ah, I kind of have a question about like hysterectomies, there's a chapter. So, you know, I really wanted that to be like this all encompassing. If you have a question, like, hopefully odds are the answers in the book. Perfect. Perfect. Exactly. And yeah. that's what we need, because there are so many questions for you, Karen, um, from our listeners. I'm going to try and pick one that we haven't discussed. I think we've kind of done the hormonal contraception. Oh, this one's quite good. So um, Neve has said, um, Every time I'm on my period, I get night sweats. Mm -hmm. Is this normal? It's not common. Um, I always tell people, even if something isn't common, if you're going through it, then it is what you're feeling. Um, so if this is something that is, you know, recent, uh, if you're in your like 30s and 40s, you know, that could be a sign of, you know, perimenopause just with the hormone fluctuations. Um, it's on a common PMS symptoms, but, you know, like anything that, you know, is only with your cycle, you know, it could be. That's just what you're going through. Um, obviously, if you're having night sweats other times, you know, there's other things that can be going on, like, you know, like thyroid issues, you know, tuberculosis. There's a lot of different things. So I always tell people there's no way to know exactly. But, um, you know, it's something that if it's bothering you, you can you can talk to your doctor. But odds are if all your testing comes back normal, it is just what it is. OK, no, that's really helpful. That's really interesting. And then we've got one from um, Lauren who said, I can't control my emotions around my period. You know, life kind of gets blown aside is there anything from a medical medical perspective i can do to manage this she's on the hormonal contraception the iud and she says her period's regular but the emotional state of it is just so overwhelming yeah i mean that sounds like the pmdd that we were talking it about does, if it's it? affecting your yeah. life your relationships, your functioning, that's PMDD. And so the way that we manage it, it's very challenging, but just the general approach, like it's not just gynecologists, it's not just psychiatrists or mental health professionals, but it's a combination of a lot of things. And we were talked about like nutrition and diet. And um, so we always recommend that people see a mental health professional because it's actually in the range of depressive disorders, anxiety disorders. Um, so counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy to help with, you know, like functioning and mood. Um, and then also sometimes people do better with things like antidepressants. So it is actually one of the few things that you can take antidepressants just certain weeks of the month. So just during those two weeks, if you don't want to be on it all the time. So some people can take it with a fact just for two weeks before their period. Um, and then also uh, the uh, IUD may control the periods just from the uterus side, but the ovaries, which are you know the issue, is that you get the hormone fluctuations of your ovaries and ovulation. That's what causes PMDD. When you ovulate, you release progesterone, that spikes and that causes the mood issues. So um, putting someone on a birth control that keeps them from ovulating is actually part of the treatment is to, you know, take away the ovulation, you have more even hormone levels. And you can even with the birth control, skip your periods entirely, like you can skip the placebo pills and just do continuous pills or, you know, neuvering or whatever, um, to avoid the ups and downs. So again, the fluctuations of the hormones um, is is the cause of that. So, um, and it's not that you have to do all of these, but uh, they're the options. Um, very, very rare. This is almost never happens. But you know, for people really severe symptoms, they even get their ovaries removed. Now, I, we all try to avoid that at all costs. But there are some people who truly like nothing else is helping. Um, and they would then get their ovaries removed and then be on HRT. But um, like I said, we try not to ever do that unless like nothing else is working. But usually we can find some less aggressive combination of like the counseling, the yeah. management of the hormone fluctuations. Of course. And you mentioned before, so first of all, two things that pop in my head. So nausea, you mentioned before some symptoms of, because someone else has written about um, endometriosis and the main changes. And you mentioned nausea as a symptom. And I can only relate 
from pregnancy feeling so nauseous because of hormonal fluctuations. Is that purely because of the hormonal fluctuation that causes the nausea or is there something else going on? Um, it can be, a, you know, a symptom of um, a PMS or even like perimenopause. Some people get nausea with that. But with the endometriosis, it's actually inflammation of your bowel. So um, endometriosis uh, is very inflammatory. Ouch. So everything around it, it can inflame. That's why people have such bad like bloating and like diarrhea, constipation, pain with bowel movements. Um, and so that actually can lead to some of the nausea symptoms as well. And also pain, pain makes you nauseous. So sometimes people feel so much pain, they throw up. So it's a combination of both the inflammation of the gut and the bowel and then also the pain it causes. It's so if so you're having those symptoms, yeah, please get help. Please do get care for yeah. that. You shouldn't have to just deal with that. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. No, I, think, I yeah. just think it's so helpful for so many women because we're not taught at school. Before I go into the fact or fiction round, we do not get taught about our bodies. So, for instance, I didn't realize and, you know, I'm a nutritional scientist, but I've never really looked at my gynecology in the way I probably should have done. I never realized an egg, literally, the reason I get ovulation pain is because it's bursting from the ovary. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize. I don't know why I, I know. didn't realize it's bursting. Well, it, who, it just, how it would you know? Down. I know because we're not taught that. It's crazy. We're yeah, it taught. literally like I've actually seen videos of it. Like you see it like wow. on the surface and it kind of just like breaks open and then like, you know, like it comes out and people, yeah, people can have a little shab, you know, a stabbing pain. It's called middle yeah. shirts. Uh, it was like yeah. a German word for that. Um, and yeah. uh, there's so much that people don't know. I, I just made a video speaking of like the the bowel and all the kind of associations. I just made a video showing the anatomy and people didn't realize, you know, you're, there's not spaces between your uterus and your rectum and your bowel and your bladder. They're all smushed together. So they're all kind of right pressed up against each other in the body. And that's why if you have something like fibroids, endometriosis, they affect your bowel so much. Like you can have all of these symptoms because they're just kind of, you know, affecting each other. And, um, you know, uh, people don't realize it. They're like, oh, that makes so much more sense now. Uh, people, even just without endometriosis, will have a little bit of like loose stool constipation from hormone fluctuations. A lot of people don't realize that either. Yeah, the period poops are like a real thing. Uh, yeah, because a little bit of looseness. Yeah, 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 because yeah. of prostaglandins. And people are like, oh my God, I didn't know other people had that too. And so there's so many of these things that are just normal function of your body things that they don't teach you in school. You know, that's that the idea of the book too. The, the US uh, subtitle is Everything You need to know about your reproductive health, but we're never told. Yeah. <laughs> in the UK, yeah. the subtitle, it's a little bit more like, you know, literal. It's like, you know, the truth about like periods and pelvic um, pain, pelvic pelvic problems, exactly. gynecological yeah. health. Yes. Yeah. They wanted it more like kind of like more uh, concrete, but the US is more like just it's everything you should <laughs> have learned. <laughs> But yeah, didn't that we you. never got told. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit more sensationalistic, but uh, but it's true. It's it, you it's should learn this stuff about your own body. Like it is, it is yeah. totally wild that yeah, we yeah. just don't we don't know about our bodies. Um, right, fact or fiction round, Karen? Oh, Are you goodness. ready? Okay, good. Okay, here we go. Question one: Most women experience menstrual abnormalities or pelvic problems in their lifetime. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. So when you look at the numbers, uh, I have people asking me about the 90% statistic we put on the book cover. And it's like 90% for a lot of things. It's like, you know, like the problems with like painful periods, uh, problems with like, you know, like urinary issues, uh, like, like 80% of women will be like, you have some leaking of urine by the time that they're in their 70s and 80s. Uh, you know, there's like, everyone has some sort of PMS. So uh, there are all of these things that affect almost everyone again, and yet somehow we don't have information about it. No, there we go. Yep. Thank you. That was a good. So number two, a tampon can get lost in your body. Not true in terms of being lost forever, uh, but sometimes people can't reach them. So oh, like uh, oh no. true that it can't get lost forever uh, because it your vagina ends at your cervix. Uh, so there's you know no way for it to get into the inside of your body. But sometimes people can't reach them or they forget, they put another tampon in and the first one gets kind of squished. So there are times that the gynecologist does have to like remove a retained tampon. So oh don't be embarrassed God. if that's happened to you. It's, it, you're wow. not the first one, ever, you know, it's happened to other people too. I can't imagine the stress women must go through if that's happened. Like, yeah, I it's, it's sometimes they get very stressed out. Like, it's I very easy to remove for us, but yeah, if yeah. you can't reach it with your fingers, people get very worried. And so, yeah, we forget you've even put, yeah, I see. Yeah. yeah, of course, mm -hmm. of course. Um, a cervical cancer is one of the most preventable and treatable forms of cancer. Absolutely. Exactly. So one of the most preventable types of cancer, which is very exciting because um, in countries where they don't have as much of a robust like kind of screening vaccination program, it's actually the most common, you know, GYN cancer. Like so if you it left to its own devices, it would be the number one cancer of women. But because we can prevent it, it's it's um, you know, we should be able to make it almost zero, which is super exciting. 
modern science. That's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, Amazing. Yeah. The delay to getting an endometriosis diagnosis is on average seven years. Yeah. So we were saying in the US, seven years. And I think in the UK, it's eight years. Yeah. Because there's extra time that you're waiting just to see a gynecologist. Yeah. Wow. And um, Black, Asian and Latina women reach menopause earlier than white women. That is actually true. Yeah. So Black, Latina, and I believe it's like um, a, like Pacific Islander uh, Asian women uh, go through menopause a little bit earlier. And, you know, the reasons we don't know, there's a lot. It's probably like to some degree, you know, some sort of like um, environmental or socioeconomic factor. Um, I think that I've seen where in some studies where like if you eliminate certain factors, that difference goes down. Um, but on average, yeah, that's true. Wow. Fascinating. Um, every woman needs to purchase feminine hygiene products. Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, everybody who has a uterus, uh, you know, at some point will have a period, most likely, unless, you know, there's certain genetic issues that yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to go yeah. into that the yeah. uterus doesn't work. But yeah. Um, but yeah, most people will have periods. Now, um, I, a lot of people now, because of concerns about like environmental factors or costs, will use things like the disc and the cups that are reusable. But, you know, you do need to replace them every once in a while. Yeah. So at some point, people are purchasing some sort of menstrual product. Yeah, of course. And that's a an issue with like, you know, period poverty, people not being able to afford menstrual products and and, you know, not being able to go to school in certain parts of the world, that sort of thing. Oh, it's just not fair. Um, in the UK, women are invited for cervical screenings at age 25. Uh, yes, I believe that is true. In the US, it's a little younger. It's 21. Um, but yeah, in the, the UK, 25. And I love, I actually love that the system is that they do invite you. In the US, it's totally, you have to take the initiative to go to the doctor and get an exam um, in the UK because of the national healthcare system. Like they do, like you know, once you reach a certain age, they know that you're out there and they they call you in, which is great. Helps to get you know more people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's important to get an STI test if you're having unprotected sex, even if you have no symptoms. Absolutely. Yeah. Most STIs don't have symptoms. And so um, especially the more common ones like gonorrhea and chlamydia, because they can cause things like they can cause infertility, they can cause tubal scarring. Uh, and because they often don't have symptoms, uh, that's why public health programs, re- you know, not require, but they do recommend routine screening for people who are sexually active. In the US, it's for 25 and under. Um, and obviously, if you have a new partner, you haven't been tested before, no matter what age you are, like there's a lot of people who are uh, senior citizens who are like, you know, postmenopausal women who are getting STIs if they, you know, say they got divorced or they're widowed and they have a new partner, you know, there's sort of a second wave of STIs um, because people, well, like, I'm not going to be able to get pregnant anymore, so I don't need to use condoms and then they get a, an infection. So it is very important with new partners, you know, get tested before stopping using condoms, um, you know, get tested again, um, you know, even if, you know, same sex partner, like, um, you know, make sure you're getting tested just because there are are, you know, you can have oral spread of STIs. Wow. Yeah. Very important to get checked, everybody. And um, UTIs can be cured by drinking cranberry juice. Uh, no. So it doesn't uh, cure UTIs. Um, there was some thought in, in, in recent years, it's sort of been a little bit debunked how effective this is, but it might help to decrease the risk of, you know, getting UTIs. Um, there was a thought that it might actually prevent bacteria from sticking to the bladder. Um, I think in recent years, it's been a little bit debunked, uh, but it, you know, can't hurt except for just the sugar content. <laughs> yeah. Or like yeah. cranberry tablets and stuff like that, but it, it doesn't um, make the bacteria go away. So if you are actually having symptoms, do get antibiotics for it. Yeah. It's demanins, isn't it? Or something it's called. I yeah. Demanins. Exactly. People, mm-hmm. If people yes. take, um, right. Some women don't experience menopause symptoms. Yes. The lucky dogs. <laughs> wow. So yeah, I know there are some people who feel nothing. They're like, should I be feeling something? I'm like, no, you're doing great. And oh, so, I want to be one. I know. Yeah. So that's also why we don't define menopause by symptoms. Um, some people think it's it's defined by, uh, you know, do you feel hot flashes? Because um, people in perimenopause, so the actual definition is just when you haven't had periods on your own for 12 months. That's It's a very simple definition. Uh, perimenopause is when you are in the years before that actually happens. And so people can be perimenopause for like 10 years or longer. Um, uh, so they can be feeling horrible hot flashes, but be having perfectly normal cycles. And, you know, so the symptoms don't actually, you know, make the definition. So important to know. People are like, well, I, you know, I, I, it can't be menopause because, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So fascinating. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And 
that really that oh gosh it wraps up the episode Karen. oh my god we got through it. so much but i remember seeing i'm like this is gonna be like a lot but we we banged through it it was great we did we love did it. i mean there was so much more i would honestly love to ask you so perhaps we'll have to do something on maybe instagram another time I oh would i would love, love that. that that would be amazing there's, there's yeah. so much to cover but honestly i think from the bottom of my heart a big thank you for everything you're doing it's incredible and the book just i can't wait to get stuck into it but my own questions in my head that i want to obviously have a think about about but we always finish with a food for thought so a take-home message and I think I'll start by just saying I think from what I've learned just chatting to you so briefly women we have to start really advocating for ourselves and we need to spread the word so it's almost like you hear something and you think do you know what actually I know there's a resource out there you can go to go and read this book or listen to this podcast and just start the conversations going because if believe it or not your friend or your neighbor or someone else is probably going for exactly the same thing as you. Exactly. Yeah. And having to experience it. So I think what I've really taken home from this is that women's health is so important. We're all going through it. Um, Karen, if you could give our listeners a far more comprehensive food for thought, what would that be? Oh, no, I love it. That's perfect. Uh, So, you know, one, you're not alone. I think a lot of people out there kind of struggling on their own, kind of feel like, oh my God, this is so horrible, but I can't talk to anybody about this or I'm the only one. It's too embarrassing. You're not alone. Chances are most women are probably going through something like what you're experiencing. Um, You deserve care. Uh, you should be able to advocate for yourself. And even within the NHS, like there are actually, um, you know, channels to get second opinions. If you're like, oh, I saw a gynecologist, they really kind of didn't understand or didn't really help me. Like you have the recourse to see someone else, get a second opinion, get a third opinion until you get the care that you deserve. And then also just that we do need to get more resources for women's health. Like it is a little ridiculous. Like when you say how many of us are struggling with this, but how few resources there are, how many options there are. Um, so, you know, hopefully someone out there there is listening can make a difference. But in the meantime, each of us individually can advocate. And if those of you who are out there who are healthcare providers, you know, please, you know, jump in. This is all of our responsibility to listen, to advocate, to educate, to speak out. So I, I know we can make a difference. And I like I tell people, it, uh, it's, it's all about just kind of like, let's make these changes that are needed in the world and that you deserve. Um, and you don't need to keep on suffering. So another kind of like big take home is even if it's common, even if a lot of people go through it, it's not normal and it's not something you have to keep suffering with. So you deserve treatment and you deserve to live your best life, to to live free of all these crazy things and, and to be as healthy as you possibly can be. Oh, Dr. Karen yeah. Tang, thank you so much. This was Honestly, amazing. That- I had such a great time. I, I, we could just keep talking for like hours and hours. Yeah. You'll have to have me back again. And so we'll. Yeah, I will. Where can everyone go to listen to more about what you have to say? Let's just direct oh, everybody. What, where can yeah. So um, all of my social media, I'm mostly on Instagram, um, a little bit on TikTok these days, um, but uh, YouTube as well. So Karen Tang, MD, K-A-R-E-N-T-A-N-G-M-D, all one word. And the YouTube has like some um, playlists with, you know, things like endometriosis and, you know, GYN surgeries, hysterectomies, tubal ligations, like a couple of things. And then obviously the book, it's on Hysteria. Uh, it's everywhere you can buy books. It's on Amazon. On Waterstones, I believe all the Waterstones have at least one copy. Request it from your local bookstores. Um, if you if you tell the bookstores that there's a need for a book, they're more likely to you know get the copies, display them, and this all is so important. I feel sad sometimes. I hear they like they hide it in the way back of the store, and like there's one copy, no one can find it. But I'm like everybody actually needs this information. It should be something that we all have access to. So, um, but yeah, you can find me in all those things. Uh, I'm excited to connect with some of your listeners. So. Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you for coming on Food for Thought. Thank you.